I'm going to pass around the attendance list, and if you have a study group, just write the name, the number, make some number, and write next to your name. So for example, number one, or number twenty-two, or number fifteen. Just write the same number next to the students in your group. Do you understand? So it should be four students in the study group. So just if you know, okay, by the start of the next class. If you didn't, don't do it by the start of the next class on Thursday or on Friday, then I will, at the start of the next class, I will randomly assign you. Okay, so check your attendance. Don't check anybody else's attendance, just your own. And put down some group if you want to make a group. Okay. So then let's uh, look at this question. So the key point of this question is to make the correct equation. First of all, so what equations do we need to use here? What equation are we going to need to use? If we look at our list of equations on page 20 and 21, which equation do we need to use? Can anybody tell me? We need to find the present value, present value of an annuity. Okay, so we have present value. We can write down the equation, right? Of an annuity equals, right? We can write down the equation from the book. <coughs> okay, and what's the other equation we need? Just a simple present value. Okay? So then, we know that we need to make these two calculations. Then we need to put the numbers in here. Okay? We can see there's a similar number here. Right? We, we can use this in both equations, 1 plus i to the power of n. Okay? And then we make the rest of the equation, right? So let's start with the simple present value. So we're looking for the present value. What's the future value? 10 million. Okay, what is the interest rate? No? 6%. The discount rate is 6%. Coupon is 5%. Okay? Does everybody understand the difference? We're getting paid a coupon. It means we're getting paid this much money every year. But the discount rate is the time value of money. The discount rate is including the risk. Okay, and the inflation, and the patience, that's the discount rate. Not, coupon is just, they decide just a random number, they're going to pay you every year. Okay, what's N? N, so what's this number, 1.06 to the power of 10? 1.79, so what's this answer? 5.5 million. Does that make sense? 10 million in the future after 10 years is worth 5.5 million today. Does that seem to make sense? No. Why not? If I invest 5.5 million today and I have compound interest of 6% a year, will I have 10 million after 10 years? Maybe, right? So it seems okay. Then what about this one? We have, what's the annuity? The present value of the annuity is? Half a million, so 0 0.5 over the interest rate. 0 0.6, 0 0.06, right? Times 1 minus 1 over, we know this number is 1.79, okay? We already, we already calculated that. Okay? So then we just need to do this calculation. Did anybody get the answer? What's the answer? 3.6. 3.6 million. So we, now what do we do next? We have the present value of the a principal, which is 10 million. We have the present value of the annuity, which was half a million. What do we do now that we know the two present values of present value of the annuity 
and the present value of the principal. What? Hmm? Sum them together, right? We're going to get this money, and we're going to get this money. Okay? We get this money at the end after 10 years. We get this money every year as a coupon. So we get the present value of the two monies and add them together. So that's 5.5 5 plus 3.6 equals 9.1 million. So how much are we going to pay for the bond today? Yes, we're at the auction. How much are we going to pay for the bond at the auction? Do you understand the auction? There's an auction. And he says 8.8 .8 million. He will pay 8.8 .8 million for the bond. Are you going to pay more than that? For the bond or not? No, you're not going to pay more than 8.8 .8 million for the bond? Not more than 9.1. No more than 9.1. We figured out the present value of this bond in today's money is 9.1 million. So yes, we will pay more than 8.8 .8 million. Okay? This bond is worth more than 8.8 .8 million. Do you understand? We figured out the present value of the bond, and now at the auction we can bid 9.1 million. All right? So we're finding out what is the value in today's money of getting 10 million after 10 years, and getting half a million every year. Okay, the value is 9.1 million. Depends on the discount rate. Do you have any question about this one? So I'll just highlight this one just as one example. Okay, so you have this page that you need to do for your assignment with a lot of different examples like this. Okay? You need to figure out what equations do I need. First, write down the equations you need. Okay? Write out the answers. Think, does my answer make sense? Okay? In this case, my answer makes sense. Okay? Why? The discount rate is higher than the coupon. The discount rate is higher than the coupon. So the value should be less than 10 million, okay? So yes, my answer makes sense. It's less than 10 million, it's 9.1. So try to figure out if your answer makes sense, okay? If you're correct or not. So you can also practice, these are other questions you can practice because we will have some of these kind of questions on the exam. So the best way is to practice, 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 okay? We've done enough in the class. So I just you need to practice yourself. You can come to my office and ask me if you have any questions. We have the study group. You can ask the people in your study group if you, you're finding it challenging, okay? And of course, by doing the assignment, it should help us to... At the end of the assignment, we'll also look at a couple of questions from the assignment. We'll look at the answer on the board, okay? So then let's move on to the next topic. So we're going to talk we're still talking about some basics of finance. Time value of money is, is uh, basics of finance. So, uh, <laughs> we're going to talk about the next topic is diversification. So, you can look at your book on page uh, 22. Diversification, risk, return, and the market portfolio. So, when we take a risk, we expect an equivalent return. So, risk equals return in finance. We have to think of that way. Because, for example, if I am uh, doing a boxing fight, okay? And I'm going to be boxing, fighting against a very big and strong guy. I want to get a higher pay. Why? Because there's a risk I can break my nose. Right? I can get some physical damage. So I'm not going to fight against the big guy unless I get paid more money. Okay? But if you ask me to fight some very small guy, maybe I don't need to get paid as much. It's not as much risk. Okay? So if we take more risk, we expect to get a higher return. That's a basic idea in finance. Investors can reduce their risk and also the return by investing in a combination of assets in different firms, industries and countries. This is called diversification. 
Dayong Hua, is that correct? Yeah. Korean? Dayong Hua. So we invest in different companies, not just one company. Okay? We invest in different countries, not just one country. So the limit of diversification is to invest in every possible asset in the world. This imaginary investment is called the market portfolio. So we would buy a little bit of every financial asset that we can own in the world. So, uh, just kind of turn off the light just for a second while we're looking at this map. So there's, this is Britain and this is Australia. So in the old days, the ships used to go from Britain to Australia, but they went two different ways. They went around Africa, here, and they went through the Suez Canal in Egypt and through here. Okay? So the same company, it was the same company with the same product, leaving at the same time, but they have two ships, and they send their ship on a different way. Okay? So discuss this question with your partner. Why would the same shipping company with the same product, let's say it's tea, for example, right? They decide to take two different routes. They sent half of their ships around South Africa and half of them through the Suez Canal. Why would they do that? So discuss with your partner. <coughs> Okay. So then, does anyone have any idea? What do you think? Why did the shipping company send the ships to different ways? What about risk? How does it reduce the risk? One ship can be destroyed. The weather, right? Yeah. The weather. Do you understand storm? We could have in the in the old days, a few hundred years ago, storms were quite dangerous for the ships. Okay, they can get they didn't have the modern navigational instrument. So they could get blown off course, they could be destroyed. If they send all their ships around Africa and there's a big storm around South Africa, they lose everything. Okay? But if they send their ships two different ways, then there's a storm here, but there's no storm here, so this one gets through. Okay? So that's, that's diversification. So people have understood diversification for thousands of years. Okay? Diversification means if we invest or put our things different ways, we can have lower risk. Do you understand that idea? We can reduce our risk by going in different ways or investing in different things. Another saying in English is don't put all your eggs in the same basket. Do you have any saying like that in your language? What saying do you have in your language? The same. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Because people used to be cycling home on the bicycle. They have a basket on the front and a basket on the back. So if they break suddenly, Maybe the, back, the bike goes forward and they lose all the eggs in the back. But they keep all the eggs in the front. <coughs> right? So they only lose half the eggs. So it's a similar idea for investments. So diversification can give reduced risk when we invest our money in different types of assets and firms. So for example, I invest in a financial company, a bank. Right? And then there's a financial crisis. I lose a lot of money. I lose all my money. Okay? But I invest in the financial company, the bank. I invest in the IT company. I invest in the automobile company. 
I invest in the online company, I invest in the electricity company. There is some financial crisis. I lose money on the bank, but that's only 20% of my money now. The other 80% is okay, especially the electricity company. Even though we had a financial crisis, people didn't stop buying electricity. Okay? So I still have that money. Okay? So I didn't lose as much money. But it works the other way too. Let's say that there is a sudden boom in the financial industry and the financial companies are making a big profit. Right? If I only own the stock in the financial company, I make a big profit. But if I own stock in the financial company and the four other companies in IT, electricity, cars and so on, then I won't make as big profit. Okay? Because that's only 20% of my investments, of my portfolio. So the risk is related to the return. So diversification, we reduce our risk, but we can also reduce our return. An important factor in measuring the benefit of diversification is correlation, or co-relation. Do you understand co in English? Co means like together. Relation. Relation together. Relationship together. So if I have, uh, you can turn on the light again please. If I have, uh, let's say, a stock in the construction, do you understand construction? And we have house prices. Do you think they are correlated? Or not correlated? Do you understand construction? Construction company, stock, I can buy the stock in the construction company, right? And I can own a house. Do you think those two things are correlated? or not correlated? Correlated, right? If people stop buying houses, what happens? The house price goes down. What happens to the construction company stock price? People stop buying houses, construction company has more business or less business? Is its profits going up or down? So what happens to the stock price? Down. So they are correlated, okay? Do I get a good diversification benefit by investing here and here? This is a good diversification benefit? No, it's not. Right? They move up together and they move down together. So they are correlated. So I don't get much diversification benefit. Let's say that uh, I invest in, let's say, the stock of the financial company for the financial crisis, okay? And then I also invest in video game company. Now, what happens when people lose their jobs? So let's say the situation is people lose jobs. <coughs> right, people are losing their job, do you understand? <coughs> What's going to happen to the financial company stock? Go up or down? Down, right? People lose their jobs, they can't pay back their loan. Do you understand? They can't pay back their loan to the bank, that's going down. What about the video game company? People are losing their jobs, they have more free time now. What's going to happen to the video game company? Stock price is going up, right? This is what happened in the financial crisis video game company stock was going up, right? What did you do during the bad hack? Did you play video games 10 hours a day, every day? No? Did anybody? Maybe one guy in the class, at least, was playing video games 10 hours a day, every day, in the bad hack? And they weren't, but if you're at university, you can't do that, right? So what do you think now? Is there some benefit from diversification here? Yes, right? They're not correlated. They're negatively correlated, the opposite. So there's benefit from diversification, okay? I invest in the financial company. When the financial company stock price goes down, the video game stock price is going up, okay? Everybody goes back to work. They have no time to play video games. Video game stock price is going down. The financial company stock price is going up. So it evens out my investments makes a lower risk, less chance of losing money, okay? 
Does everybody understand that idea? So, correlation in the world of finance is a statistical measure of how two securities move in relation to each other. Correlation is measured using the correlation coefficient with ranges between minus one and one. Minus one means that we have exactly opposite relationship. If I make a graph, one stock is going up, the other stock is going down. Okay? Financial company going down, video game company going up. Right? This one goes down, this one goes up. This is minus one correlation, negatively correlated. Okay? On the other hand, the construction company and the house price, house price is going up, construction company price is going up. Okay, house price is going down, construction company price is going down. That is one correlation, right? One is the maximum correlation. Then we have, we could have a zero correlation. Zero correlation means there's just no relationship. We can't see any relationship, right? This is going up and down like that. This one, it's not, it's, maybe it's hard to show, no relationship, but sometimes when this is going up, this is going up, sometimes it's going down, right? So just there's no relationship between the two of them. It's going to be a correlation of zero. So in the real life, we don't have any exactly one correlation or exactly minus one correlation. Most of the correlations are around, you know, highly correlated 0.8. Not much correlation, 0 0.2. Okay, a bit of negative correlation, minus 0 0.2. Another thing which is commonly negative, negatively correlated is gold and the stock market. Okay, because in the time of high risk, people buy gold. They sell their stocks and buy gold, so the gold price goes up. Okay, but in the risk-off environment, people sell their gold and buy stocks. They like to take, there's not much risk in the global environment, they prefer to invest in stocks. Then the gold price goes down and the stock price goes up. So that's a, just a very common diversification. I invest in stocks and in gold. So some pension fund, you understand pension fund? They can invest in gold and stocks because they're negatively correlated, usually. So in our example above, if the storms generally happened at the same time on both routes, so if we looked at the world weather, and when there is a storm in Africa, there's also a storm around the Middle East. In that case, we don't get any benefit from sending the ships the two ways, because storms happen at the same time. No benefit. On the other hand, if a storm is happening in one route, and there's no, means there's no storm on the other route, which is more like the real situation, right? Maybe the weather patterns, that if there happens to be a storm in the south, maybe there's no storm near the Middle East, okay? <coughs> then we get the most benefit from diversification. So, correlation is very related to diversification. If two things are correlated, not much benefit from diversification. If they are negatively correlated, more benef benefit from diversification. So, do you have any questions so far? So we can look at risk. We're, we're seeing some statistical vocabulary today, uh, like correlation. And the next one is variance. And variance around expected returns. So, uh, just we need to explain these things, right? So we can look at risk for stock prices as historical variance around expected returns. Do you understand expected returns? Expected returns is, next year I expect the price to go up by 10%. Okay, that's my expected returns, okay? Then did the stock price go up by 10%? No, it just went up by 5%, okay? So in that year, the variance was 10 minus 5, 5%, okay? So variance around expected returns is a measure of the square difference 
between the actual returns and the expected returns. So we're going to make a square. Find the difference between the expected return, we expected to get 10%. The actual return, we actually got 5%. The difference is 5% and squared. So it's going to be 0 0.05 squared. Okay? That is the variance in that year. Okay? So variance just means like difference. Okay? Like if something varies, it means it changes or it's different. So variance is how we expected this much, but we got this much. So how different was it? Okay? So that is variance. So we can look at a high variance, like an investment in stock in an oil drilling firm. That is a high variance investment. Do you understand oil drilling? Drilling is putting the drill into the ground to find oil. So do you want to invest in the oil drilling company? They're looking for oil now. They don't have oil, but they're looking for oil. Why, why don't you want to invest in the oil drilling company? Very risky, right? If they find oil, you can get a lot of money. If they don't find, find oil, you just lost all your money. Okay? Do you understand? So that's quite risky. So if we looked at the historical data for the last 30 years, and we compared the expectation of investors at the start of the year with the actual performance of the stock price, price of the oil drilling firm, we're going to see a big difference every year. Okay. Let's say that you expect to get 15% return or 20% return, right, next year. But one year it might be minus 90%. Okay? Next year the stock price could be plus 150%. Okay? But you expect this every year. So the variance is going to be very high. In this case the variance will be 70%, so 0.7 squared. Okay, and in this year, the variance is going to be 1.3 squared. Okay? So, we add all those variances together. And this is a way of measuring that this is a risky company. Okay? We're looking at the history. Do you understand history? history? Historical data. In the past, did we get as much money as we expected? Or was it very different than we expected? If it's very different than we expected, then we say this is a risky company. Does that make sense? So we can look at risk as variance around expected returns. Okay? If the company has a high variance, a high change or a high difference between the real return and the expected return, then we say that's a risky company. But, for example, an electricity company, we expect to get the 5% return, we get 6% return. It's a very small difference, okay? Because we're pretty sure people are going to pay their electricity bill and we're going to get the profit at the end of the year, okay? Then, a type of investment with no variance is we talked about the risk-free investment, the US government bond. So, for example, we invest in the 10-year United States government bond. It's risk-free. If we look at the last 30 years, there is no variance around expected returns. Why? We always get exactly the same returns as we expected. Because the government didn't miss any payments. Did the US government miss any payments in the last 30 years? Did they ever say to investors, sorry, we're not making the payment this year? No. Right? So what, we always got our money back. Let's say we get our 10 million back on our bond. Right? And we always get the coupon payment. Okay, coupon payment, let's say 5%. So we get our 5% every year, we expect it to get our 5% every year, so no variance. We get our 10 million at the end, we expect it to get 10 million at the end, so no variance, risk free. Okay? So by looking at the variance, the changing around the expected returns, we can measure the risk. This one has no variance, no risk. The oil drilling firm, very high variance, uh, very high risk. So let's look at this example. It also shows the benefit of diversification. 
So let's say we have two stocks, stock one and stock two. The variance around expected returns for stock one is 10% and stock two is 20%. So which stock is more risky? Second one, right? First one usually is just 10% different from what we expect. Second one is 20% different than what we expected. Okay? If both stocks are perfectly correlated, which of course never happens in real life, but let's pretend they are perfectly correlated, we invest 50% of our money in stock one and 50% of our money in stock two. Then we can find the weighted average variance of the two stocks. So weighted average is another statistical uh, that idea that we need to know. So let's look at the example here for finding the weighted average. So for weighted average, we have weight multiplied by the number plus weight multiplied by the number. So in this case, the weight is 50%. Do you understand weight? How do you say weight in Korean? So it's a little bit unusual in this case, right? But we mean how weight here means how important or how much. How much of one is there and how much of two is there? Okay? So there's 50% of one and there's 50% of two. 0.5 and 0.5. So weight of one is 0.5, weight of two is 0.5. The variance of one is 10%, 0.1. The variance of two, 20%. Okay? So when we invest our money in one and we invest half our money in two, what's the variance going to be? It's going to be 15%. Does that make sense? Half our money is in the stock with a 10% variance. Half is in the stock with a 20% variance. So the average is 15%. Okay? Weighted average in the middle. Okay? That's if they're perfectly correlated. So weighted average we're going to use during the course. So we can do some more examples just to make sure you understand. So just you try to find the weighted average. One, two, three. So we have 30% of one, we have 40% of two, and we have 30% of three. <coughs> okay, so what is the weighted average number? So make the calculation and tell me. So, how, where did you get 33.3 from? Hmm? Sum and divide by three. Sum up? So you get 30 percent? Eight point. This is point three. This is point eight. This is point nine. Three multiplied by point three. So we have 30 percent of number three. We have 40 percent of number two and we have 30% of number one. What's the weighted average number? Okay, so make the calculation and tell me. What is the weighted average number here? So everybody needs to do this calculation. I should see everybody with their pen and paper. Yes? Well, like, we have to do it like this. The weight multiplied by the number. What's the weight multiplied by the number? Plus the weight multiplied by the number. Plus the weight multiplied by the number. Okay? Then you get... Hmm? Yes, you can use 1, 2, 3 for variance in, in this equation. It's just a number. So we need to know how to make the weighted average calculation. That's a simple calculation, okay? So everybody needs to attempt this calculation. So, 
So everybody should be able to do this. We have 30% of one, 40% of two, and 30% of number three. What's the weighted average? Two. Two? Point two. So we're going to have, here we're going to have one multiplied by point three, plus two multiplied by point four, plus three multiplied by point three, equals point three plus point eight plus point nine, okay? equals 2. Okay, does everybody understand how to make a weighted average? The weighted average in this case is 2. Okay, so now that we've done that, let's try another one. One more weighted average. Maybe some students missed on the first one. They're going to try it. Every student should get this one, right? So we have 77. We have 15% of 77, right? We have 12, we have 45%. Okay, and then we have 162, we have 40%. So find the weighted average of these three numbers. Okay? So we just did the example of the last one on the board, so every student should be able to do this correctly. Find the weighted average of these three numbers. So if I see students who are not doing this calculation, it's not because of lack of ability, okay? That's lack of effort. And I already explained to students at the start of the course that if you make an effort, you can get a passing grade. But if students don't make an effort, if I see that students are not making any effort, then it means that they can't get a passing grade in the class. Okay? That's fair. If you don't understand and you don't make an effort, then you cannot expect to get a passing grade in the class. You can't come to me at the end of the course and say, please give me C grade or D grade. 
Okay? Then I'm going to say, I'm sorry you didn't make any effort when I was teaching you some very straightforward thing in the class. Okay? So, this is very simply, multiply 77, multiplied by 15%. 12 multiplied by 45%, and 162 multiplied by 40%. Okay? And then you get your answer. Okay? So, 77 multiplied by 0 0.15. Okay? Plus 12 multiplied by 0.45. Plus... 162 multiplied by 0.4 equals. Okay, so what's the answer? 81.75. Okay, so this is weighted average calculation. We're going to use again in the future during the class. Okay, so. Uh, do you have any question about that? About the weighted average calculation? No? So I think we don't have much time left, so we won't go into this equation, which is the equation for showing the mathematical advantage of diversification. Okay? But uh, we'll uh, finish there for today. Okay? If you have any other question, you can ask me at the end of the class. Weight is a percentage. Yeah, like it's not the weight. Percent.